Star Trek Nemesis, the film that gave us the gift of Tom Hardy in a purple reflecto suit and Ron Perlman looking like a giant demon elf. Which was a stretch for a man who usually just plays a giant demon. I actually have a warm place in my heart for this movie, and I'll get to that. But many Trekkies consider Nemesis, which turned out to be the swan song for what many consider to be the best Star Trek cast in the entire franchise, to be a god-awful mess of a film that did a horrendous disservice to the crew of the USS Enterprise-E and nearly killed the entire franchise, almost for good. Because certainly, while Star Trek Enterprise did continue on after this film for a couple of years, and Enterprise actually got better after this point, it didn't really help. Hell, despite the franchise having three movies and a TV series since Nemesis, up until Star Trek Picard coming out in a few weeks, it remained the furthest we'd ever gotten in the Trek timeline. Besides some amazing beta canon stuff, video games, and a brief scene in the 2009 Star Trek movie. So it actually came as kind of a surprise to me when I made a video about a year ago where I made a few jokes at the expense of Star Trek Nemesis and found that a lot of people in the comments really, really liked this movie. And it's funny because like I said, Star Trek Nemesis actually has a special place in my heart. Star Trek has inspired me to become who I am and my first contact with Star Trek was Nemesis. Or more specifically, this Star Trek Nemesis audiobook. My dad played the audiobook in the car one day, and I fell in love with the world that I heard. And I gotta say, Star Trek audiobooks back then were pretty damn cool. I mean, listen to this. As Picard materialized onto the Enterprise, he saw through the gaping hole in his bridge a brilliant flash as the scimitar dissolved into whirling bits of shrapnel. He did not permit himself to look away, to close his eyes, or to shield them but permitted himself to be temporarily blinded. I mean, look at that. You have Boyd Gaines' amazing narration, all this sound effects and music. You just don't get that level of production in the audiobooks today. Anyways, audiobook criticism aside, Star Trek Nemesis, for all of its faults, gave me the gateway into this life-defining franchise. And for that, I will always be grateful. So I think it's worth taking a moment, what with Star Trek Picard on the horizon, to look back at the film that began, or ended, it all. And before we go any further, just a quick reminder to hit that subscribe button and the like button. It really helps this video get shown to other people, and I spend a lot of time on them, so it honestly means the world to me. Now it's time to engage. I think it's worth taking a look. After the lukewarm but still successful Star Trek Insurrection in 1998, the Next Generation cast's three-film contract had completed. And Nemesis only got off the ground due to a phone call between Brent Spiner and his friend John Logan, the writer of Ridley Scott's Gladiator. And to have a chance to get in and start shaping some of that mythology and being involved with bringing that story forward a little bit was a dream. Stuart Baird, who had only directed two films prior to this point, was brought on to direct Nemesis to bring in fresh blood, according to Rick Berman. This sadly completely ignored Jonathan Frakes, who had directed the last two Star Trek films, and was, you know, right there. Baird didn't consider himself a Star Trek fan, and didn't watch any of the series before directing the movie. Except for a few hiccups where I didn't quite know all the, the procedures, if you like, on the, on the Star Trek. For this reason, a lot of fans blame Baird for the failures of the film. Certainly non-Trek fans have made great movies in the franchise, like Nicholas Meyer, director of Wrath of Khan and Undiscovered Country, and J.J. Abrams directing Star Trek 2009, and another film that we're not going to talk about. But Baird didn't even watch Star Trek. Meyer had went back and watched everything that was available at the time, and love or hate Abrams, you have to at least recognize that he had some grasp of the Trek canon when he did 2009 Star Trek. And I know some of you will argue with me, but come on, he referenced Archer's Beagle. I think he understood a little bit of Trek. I tested it on Admiral Archer's prize Beagle. Well, I know that dog, what happened to it? I'll tell you when it reappears. And this isn't me saying, canon is everything. You must know everything there is to know about Star Trek research every single episode throughout the entire 50 year history and you need to be able to reference exactly what happens in season three, episode four. Which actually, I don't even know what that one is and I'm a huge Trekkie. It's Kirk. 
No, what bothers me more is when you don't find thematic or character consistency in your work. What's worse is that Baird apparently didn't even care on the set. Apparently doing things like getting LeVar Burton's name wrong and referring to the Geordie character as an alien. I mean, it's got to be really disheartening to have your boss go around not even caring about something that you've invested over a decade of your life into. Do you remember anything of your life before you were on the planet? No. Why does the tall man have a furry face? To have someone come in who's never ever seen Star Trek before, and when you say to him, you know, well my character wouldn't do that, and he says I don't care, do it anyway. You know, first of all you want to punch his lights out, but second of all he is the director and you kind of have to do what he says, because he just keeps making you do it over and over again until you do. Yeah, that's what I want for my culmination of an entire franchise film, to completely forget that everything else existed. Star Trek Nemesis came out in 2002. With a budget of 60 million, it went on to only gross a paltry 67 million worldwide, which partially came from the negative critical reception of the film, but also because it came out against Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets, The Two Towers, and Die Another Day. So uh, I guess you could say uh, competition was tough. I guess it is better than Die Another Day. So let's get into the actual film. For those of you who don't remember the plot of this film, basically, the Romulan Senate gets murdered by way of Voldemort by some guy named Shinzon, who takes over the government. Back on Earth, Riker and Troy are getting married, and Worf gets really hungover. Apparently because no one bothered to explain to Michael Dorn how his character rejoined Starfleet after becoming an ambassador at the end of Deep Space Nine. On the way to the Troy ceremony on Beta Z, the Enterprise gets sidetracked near the Romulan border when they find an early prototype of Data called the B4. I get it. It's the B4 because it was B4 Data. Also, that doesn't really make sense because B4 would have been made first, so he wouldn't have necessarily known that he was B4 anything. All right, we'll just, we'll just move on. Shinzon requests a diplomatic envoy from the Federation, and since they're close, the Federation sends the Enterprise. The Enterprise gets to Romulus and, surprise, turns out Shinzon was a clone of Picard made by the Romulans, who was eventually discarded, or dis -picarded, am I right? And sent to the never before mentioned sister planet to Romulus, Remus, which is inhabited by a not at all evil looking race called Remans, who raised him to be bitter and cold hearted. Despite pretending to be good for a while, Shinzon mentally assaults Troy reveals that B4 was working for him all along, and then kidnaps Picard because he needs his blood to cure Shinzon's crappy cloning, apparently. Data rescues Picard, they escape, and Shinzon goes to try to destroy Earth and apparently the entire Federation because, uh, um, reasons. There's a big battle where the Romulan military, which had up to this point supported Shinzon, betrays him because, again, um, r reasons. He's not planning to defeat Earth. He's planning its annihilation. And eventually the Enterprise gets so damaged that Picard has to beam over to kill Shinzon and blow up the damn ship! But Data goes over as well and saves Picard, but dies himself. Picard is very sad, but turns out B4 may have some of Data's memories in him, so it's kind of hopeful a bit maybe at the end there. And that's the end of the entire Star Trek timeline until Star Trek Picard in a few weeks. Yep, the furthest in the timeline we got was Brent Spiner singing. Oh, and I guess Romulus gets blown up in Star Trek 2009. Serves them right for making this guy their ruler. But the point is that finally the Empire is realizing that there is a better way, and that way is peace. So most Trekkies love to simply bash on this film, and not without good reason. But like I said, I do have a fondness for this movie considering my personal history with it, so I do want to mention some of the things that I think are good in this film, because there are a few. First off, I actually really love Admiral Janeway's cameo here. Certainly, this isn't the first cameo in all of Trek, there's actually been a ton, and it's not even the first in the films, but I really like these small moments on the big screen. It's a moment of fan service, yes, but a small one, and one that really makes the big budget feature films feel like they connect up with the rest of the universe especially the TV universe. And it's done in a way that doesn't detract from the experience of anyone who doesn't know who Janeway is, but only adds to the experience of those who do. That's how you do great fan service. My name is Khan. Cool, bro. Uh, good for you. 
don't know what that means. I also really love the wedding scene in this film. This is perhaps the only scene in the entire movie that truly feels like it's a send off for these characters. It really lets the characters have a moment to breathe, and actually gives us a sense of the real caring and history that this crew that we followed for so many years has with each other. Picard's speech is a rare moment of irreverence and whimsy from a captain who has often been considered aloof. I have represented the Federation in first contact with 27 alien species, but none of this compares with my solemn duty today as best man. I mean, compare this moment here with his first appearance in Encounter at Farpoint, the first episode of Star Trek The Next Generation. But since a captain needs an image of geniality, you're to see that's what I project. Aye, sir. As well as the last episode of the series, All Good Things. I should have done this a long time ago. And now you finally get to this. He's a tyrannical martinet who will never, ever allow me to go on away missions. That is the regulation, sir. Starfleet Code, Section 12, Paragraph Mr. Data? 4. Sir? Shut up. Yes, sir. <laughs> you really see an arc for Picard through all of these moments, showing that he's really loosened up and has become someone that can be a good commander and leader, but also doesn't have to be quite so distant. You refuse to let him beam down to Altair 3. In my opinion, sir, Altair 3 was too dangerous to risk exposing the captain. When your first officer insists that you can't go on away missions, ignore him. I intend to. It also really feels like a combination of Picard and Riker's relationship. Will Riker, you have been my trusted right arm for 15 years. You have kept my course true and steady. Picard and Riker, and Troy to an extent, can finally see each other not as crew members or subordinates, but equals and friends. And re-watching this scene made me all the more excited to see how their friendship has evolved by the time we get to Star Trek Picard. And the rest of the wedding scene is just chock full of fine little character moments that are really sweet. Also, I gotta love the transgender call out. Ladies and gentlemen, and invited transgender species, this is me. Honestly, this whole scene is one of my favorite sequences in any Star Trek film. Speaking of things that are in Star Trek films, there's actually a really wonderful deleted scene from this movie between Picard and Data that really sets up Data coming into his own as First Officer. I could not help wondering about the human capacity for expressing both pleasure and sadness simultaneously. Certain human rituals, weddings, birthdays, funerals, evoke very strong and very complex emotions because they mark important transitions in our lives. They denote the passage of time. Not just the passage of time, but the presence of time within us. They make us think of our mortality. These occasions encourage us to think about what's behind us and what lies ahead. I really, really wish this scene had stayed, as it actually properly sets up Data's death later on. Without it, it makes Data's death feel really hollow, but we'll get to that, don't worry. Apparently, according to Rick Berman, over 50 minutes of footage was cut from Nemesis, mostly character moments, in order to focus on the big battle at the end of the movie. Which is a shame, because Star Trek has never really been about the big battles, but always about the characters. And keeping those in could have really made this film hit a lot harder. And finally, while the cinematography isn't anything to write home about, it's definitely solid. And I do have to give real credit to the set design, costuming, and special effects on this movie. They all look really, really good. And the CGI, while a bit wonky here or there, still mostly holds up today, which is honestly a feat. I'm afraid you won't survive to witness the victory of the echo over the voice. So with those positives out of the way, I have to get into why this film really doesn't work as a cohesive whole, as it attempts to dive into its theme of nature versus nurture. But to get there, I gotta talk about some of the long string of bad choices that were made to get there. First things first, there's a lot of needless action scenes throughout this film. The best action isn't just stuff that's happening on screen, but actually builds character has moments that advance the plot, or reveals who these characters are. Remember that scene in First Contact where Picard kills the Borg in the holodeck, shooting the Borg over and over again, even after they're dead? It shows us how angry he is at the Borg. I think you got him. 
Then it's revealed that the Borg used to be his own crew members, and Picard doesn't even care because he just got to kill some Borg. Jean-Luc, it's one of your uniforms. Yes, this was Ensign Lynch. Tough luck, huh? It's honestly chilling, but true to his character, and it shows us that. But in Nemesis, it's always just action for action's sake. It's just dull with zero tension. Take this dune buggy scene. Everyone looks so tired to be there, except Patrick Stewart, because at least he's having fun driving a dune buggy. But uh, I've been itching to try the Argo. I'll bet. But seriously, this action sequence is clearly forced. Who are these aliens attacking them? Sure, there's some exposition on the bridge to explain it, but really they're just there as an alien species that makes an action sequence happen. I have no genuine concern that Picard, Data, and Worf are in any real danger. Unless I believe that these discount Jawas are really going to be the ones that take out Worf. Honestly, that'd actually be hilarious. As much as I like Worf, that would have been so funny, I wish it had happened. Now, Needless Action does not a bad movie make. There are tons of good movies that have pointless action scenes that really add nothing to the rest of the film. Uh, uh, hold on a second! I bet you even forgot that that scene happened in that movie. But what the J.J. Abrams pointless action does, that Nemesis doesn't, is that they at least have a kineticism to them. They keep pushing forward, keep us engaged and entertained in a way that feels really fun in the moment. Sure, it's like sugar, completely empty calories that I wish weren't there, but at least taste good sometimes. I'm not saying that they're great filmmaking by any means, but with Nemesis, I'm just bored. Almost every single action scene in this film is just noise. It gets a tad better later in the movie, like when Riker goes to fight the Viceroy in the bowels of the Enterprise. Which, by the way, where the hell is this really long endless shaft on the ship? I mean, it's near the bottom of the Enterprise too, so where is this fall? People complain about Discovery having weird cavernous chambers, but the germ of that started here in Nemesis, not with J.J. Abrams like everyone thinks. But whatever, people are gonna hate on Disco. With this scene, we at least get a fight between two named characters, so it at least has more weight to it, but it still feels somewhat pointless. We know Riker's not gonna die to the silly little sub-boss Ron Perlman, but it's again just a fight to break up the space battles going on elsewhere. The only action that really feels remotely tense is when the Enterprise rams the scimitar, which is admittedly really cool, and it's awesome to see the Enterprise without a view screen, even if the damage is weirdly conveniently placed. And then when Picard goes over to fight Shinzon, there's some tension there as well, because at least we have some nominal emotional investment in both of these characters, and I'll get to Shinzon in a second. But it really just devolves into an extended fist fight sequence with a ticking clock for the potential destruction of the Enterprise, with no real reveal of character until the very end of the scene. I'm glad we're together now. Our destiny's complete. And as much as I love Picard, he's not exactly the most punchy character I've seen. Speaking of character, we've got to talk about Shinzon and Tom Hardy. Now, I'm a big, big fan of Tom Hardy. I love the man, and even when he's at his worst, he always elevates a movie for me. I mean, God, half the reason Venom is watchable is because of Tom Hardy. It's clear he's just having so much fun. I, just, uh, but I, mean, I think I may have been infected. Yeah, yeah. Hey, Eddie, up. you look like you're in a bad hey, way. Hey, I am in a bad way. Eddie, Jesus! This is dead. In fact, you know what? I'm wrong. It's more than half the reason that it's watchable. In fact, it's the entire reason that Venom is watchable. But here in Nemesis, Tom Hardy just doesn't work. There's this big reveal scene where we learn that Shinzon is a clone of Picard as Hardy steps out of the shadows. But the audience is just left going, oh, okay, it's a, it's a bald human. Not, not, not a Romulan, cool. Is, is that supposed to be somebody? It's supposed to be this big moment, but just falls flat because we don't realize that he's supposed to be a clone of Picard at that moment. It really needed to be Patrick Stewart playing against himself to make this work. Imagine if Patrick Stewart had walked out of the shadows here. It would have immediately made the scene 10 times more intriguing. As it is, it has no real surprise impact until we get to the convoluted discussion of disease that both Shinzon and Picard shared. I developed a hypersensitivity to sound. Even the slightest whisper caused me agony. Eventually I was treated, and now I can hear as well as you can, Captain. Just the two of us. Or should I say, just the one of us. That still doesn't really make anything clear until they actually state in a scene later that Shinzon is a clone. 
There's no doubt, Captain. Right down to your aggressive strain of Shalaf syndrome. He's a clone. We are told rather than shown, which is a cardinal sin in filmmaking. And it might have saved Tom Hardy years of substance abuse and a marriage. And the rest of the movie, outside of a couple moments, Shinzan never really feels like he's a double of Picard. Hardy doesn't really give a good interpretation of Stuart's Picard through his own lens. It's just playing his own character. And as a result, it really doesn't make Shinzan serve the purpose that he's supposed to serve as a double of Picard. Are you ready to plunge the entire quadrant into war to satisfy your own personal demons? It amazes me how little you know yourself. I am incapable of such an act. You are me! Certainly, the argument could be made that he should be completely different from Picard if you fall more on the nurture side of the nature versus nurture debate. And Stuart Barrett said that that was his intention. Hardy had a street quality about him, which was good. I didn't want somebody like Patrick Stewart now. I wanted Patrick Stewart or Picard under other circumstances. But the film itself never really broaches this or discusses it all that much. So it really ultimately just feels like Tom Hardy isn't doing a good performance, which must have been hard for an actor at the beginning of his career and who we now know has tons of talent. Oh. No. Baird also went on to say that they hired Hardy because of his sex appeal, which, yeah, okay, you got me. That, that checks out, I'm okay with that decision. I'll be in my bunk. Okay, so now I have to get to the hardest part to talk about in this movie. But we gotta talk about it because it's a thing, and honestly, I have a lot to say. This is really one of the worst things to ever happen in a Star Trek movie. Perhaps the worst thing in all of Star Trek. And Star Trek has had its share of bad, bad moments. I'm coming, where are you? It is the way in which we propagate our species. Please, demonstrate how this is accomplished. Hope you laughed there because I gotta bring it down now. Because with all the other criticisms that I have with this movie, I, I don't hate them. I think this movie can often be uninspired or dull or whatever, but I don't sit there really upset at them. They just are a thing. I so rarely get upset at anything in Star Trek, if ever. I usually just go, oh well, here's my criticism of this. They could have done that better. That's just who I am. So when I tell you that this part actually angers me, I mean it enrages me. And that part is the rape of Troy. So basically, Shinzon decides at one point in the movie to use his viceroy to mentally rape Troy. Now, you may say, oh well, it's just a mental violation. It's just a metaphor for a rape. But no, the film actually makes a point of saying that this violation is very clearly sexual in nature. What did this even do? Up until this point, Shinzon had been pretending to be a good guy. You don't trust me. I have no reason to. You have every reason. If you had lived my life and experienced the suffering of my people, you would be standing where I am. Deanna. But your heart doesn't constrain itself to me. You would be standing where I am. So he's pretending to be a good guy and then decides to rape Troy? Not even secretly, he just clearly does it. Just because? And this is how the crew finds out that Shinzon is bad. Because apparently Shinzon just couldn't keep it in his pants. This is how the writers chose to decide to make their big villain who has this master plan reveal that he's bad in this pointless scene. But it really just goes to show you how little Trek ever knew what to do with Troy. Not to mention female characters as a whole. I mean, what does Crusher ever do in literally any of the Trek movies besides set up a Star Trek Voyager cameo? And have you noticed how your boobs have started to firm up? Not that we care about such things in this day and age. Uh-huh. Because here, we see a recycled plot come into play. Because this isn't the first time Troy has been mentally raped. It actually came up in an earlier episode of Star Trek The Next Generation. And that episode, for all of its faults, at least made the rape the point of the episode. I'm, so, I'm sorry. Well, try and rest. Take the necessary sleep inducements if you have to. And I'm not saying that the entire film needed to be about Troy dealing with being violated. 
but you need to at least do something with it other than just using that attack to further a plot in a needlessly arbitrary way. I mean, I've had issues with some events in Star Trek. I've numerous times criticized the original series for not properly handling the attempted rape of Yeoman Rand by evil Captain Kirk and the enemy within. But at the very least, that scene had some semblance of thematic purpose within the plot. In Star Trek Nemesis, the assault serves no real purpose. It's basically Shinzon's kick the dog moment. That moment in films, mostly westerns, where the bad guy just kicks a dog just to show the audience that he's clearly the bad guy. So basically Troy, a character that fans have come to know and love for seven seasons and three movies, is raped just so she can serve the same plot function as a dog. And they even cut a scene where she's raped again. There were thousands of more interesting ways to show that Shinzon was evil. And they could have done so in a way that didn't make Shinzon feel impulsive or dumb and ultimately just plain unforgivable. The movie took pains to try and make us care about this character up until this point, and there's no way I'm gonna feel for him in any way, shape, or form after this moment. What's more is it also weirdly implies that Picard himself had a thing for Deanna, which isn't remotely addressed, and this horrific choice is even more compounded later on in the film when Picard refuses to let Troy take time off to recover. It was, uh... It was a violation. I've become a liability. I request to be relieved of my duties. Permission denied. If you can endure more of these assaults, I need you at my side, now more than ever. Picard, the man who is perhaps the most empathetic and understanding character that we have seen in Trek, ignores this woman, this friend, who has been violated in such a truly horrific way by a man that looks like Picard himself and happened during sex with her husband who she just married. I can't even imagine how emotionally traumatic that must be. And when she asks to have some time for herself, Picard says, nope, you have to keep going. Permission denied. If you can endure more of these assaults, I need you at my side. Try and rest. Take the necessary sleep inducements if you have to. And what's more, Picard even asks Troy to mentally assault her abuser later on in the film. And yes, I get that it's played like a rah rah, I'm going to get my vengeance for what you did to me moment which I guess is at least a little appreciated rather than it just being ignored, but the whole thing just feels gross. I don't know who decided that this needed to occur in a Star Trek movie. And again, I so rarely say that something isn't Star Trek because Star Trek can be many things, but this, this is not Star Trek. And it is one of the worst things, if not the worst thing to happen in Star Trek ever, period. The assault was the most difficult scene. Uh, we, we played it for real. It's the only way you can. You can't pretend that something like that is going on. You really have to go for it. And um, it was possibly one of the most challenge, challenging days I've ever had as an actress. Um, I was very happy it was over. I mean, it's known around Hollywood that we are a very fun-loving cast. Uh, there were not many laughs that day. Whew, okay, whew. All right, we're good. I got that on my system. Let's just take a moment. And relax. Let's watch this clip of Picard dancing for a second. Gee, you look good to me, ain't you so heavenly? I, you're the one I idolize. Oh, I feel better now. All right. Whew, we good? All right, let's move on. Some ideals are worth dying for, aren't they, jean -Luc? Speaking of Shinzon's plan, what really was it? I have a purpose. Then perhaps you'll enlighten us. Silence from you! He kills everyone in the Romulan Senate, though with no real plan, I guess, to actually run the government other than to just sit in that room with Ron Perlman. Then you lure the Enterprise close to the Romulan border with the B-4, which serves the dual purpose of making the Enterprise the ship that will come when you request an envoy, and gives you a spy on the ship. Okay, that's actually pretty smart, though I don't know why he couldn't have just requested the Enterprise. He is now the leader of Romulus and the Enterprise is the flagship, so it makes sense that he would request it. Also, he really has to hope that they're able to actually find and activate the B4 without dying on that planet, and then give B4 access to the entire ship without thinking about it. Also, we're not gonna explore why the B4 even exists or how Shinzon got a hold of him. You may go. Where? Out of my sight. Okay, sure, fine, whatever. Doesn't need to be addressed, I guess. 
Okay, then you're going to kidnap a card to heal your weird blood problem. Okay, then you're going to immediately go out and destroy Earth right that second with your Thaleron Radiation Doomsday device that just kills everything that you apparently have and we're also not going to explain how you got it. Uh, but you're going to do all that because you just, you want to rule things for some reason. If your issues are with me, then deal with me. This has nothing to do with my ship, nothing to do with the Federation. Oh, but it does. We will no longer bow before anyone as slaves. Not the Romulans and not your mighty federation. We are a race bred for war. There is a better way, and that way is peace. Why is that the plan? Wouldn't the federation just destroy your single ship, even if you do have this ultimate doomsday weapon? I mean, the ship didn't even survive a battle with one singular federation ship, the Enterprise. What were you gonna do against a whole fleet? Sure, you may have taken out Earth, but I'm pretty sure you wouldn't have gotten to anywhere else. Why wouldn't it have been better to actually make peace with the Federation, kindly ask Picard to help you with your blood disease, and then rule Romulus yourself, and then maybe later attack the Federation? Also, what is with the blood disease thing that Shinzon has, this ticking time bomb? Presumably, he's been planning this coup and ultimate destruction of the Federation for years, but apparently only decides to actually enact it when he has literally hours before he's left to die? Come on, man. And what did this add to the movie anyways, besides that unnecessary ticking clock? That he wanted to kill Picard? Wasn't his whole, the victory of the echo over the voice, deal a much more thematically interesting and relevant reason to want to kill Picard? Ultimately, we're left with a bad guy who just is an evil dude with a doomsday machine. Where have I seen that before? Khan, you've got Genesis, but you don't have me. Genesis! I want it! Wrong us. Shall we not revenge? Believe me, this is the only one. What a federation. We'll never know what happened here. Hi, Christopher. I'm Nero. But if it's any consolation, I was never going to spare your crew. A means to bring the galaxy back to the struggle that made humanity strong. Sure, Shinzon made a tad more interesting because of his relationship to Picard, but as I said before, nothing really comes out of that other than a few somewhat interesting brief moments. Speaking of which, let's talk about plot holes for a second. Why doesn't Data have two of the teleportation ring thingies? Could have saved his life at the end of the film too. Why can't they use the teleportation ring thingy to find out where the cloak ship is, especially if it has a signal? Why does the Romulan military support Shinzon then later betray him in the film when he's doing exactly what they wanted? And in two days, the Federation will be crippled beyond repair. Does that satisfy you? For the moment. Why does Picard have to be the one to go to Shinjan's ship at the end, depriving his ship of its leader in the middle of a battle? Sure, I guess he has some personal vendetta with Shinzon, but it seems like a really bad choice for a commander. How were the Remans, a downtrodden slave race, able to build what is essentially the best ship in all of Star Trek? That is until Star Trek 2009, apparently, where Romulan miner Nero has an even better ship. Apparently lower class Romulans have freaking amazeballs ships, so I guess that's at least consistent across canon, even if it makes no logical sense. Serving with you has been an honor. All right, let's start to wrap this up because speaking of shallow understandings, Star Trek Nemesis is a film that really, really wants to have a theme, but never really gets to it. Obstensively, it's a film about nature versus nurture about the different paths we could walk if we led another life. Now, the idea of doubles being used to explore duality or different shades inside of a human being isn't exactly the most original idea, not even for Star Trek. One of the first episodes in the entire franchise was The Enemy Within, where Kirk split in two. Spock also had a freaking 40 foot tall double in a truly classic episode of the animated series. Star Trek The Next Generation also did this with Riker, the Changelings in Deep Space Nine kind of touched upon this too. The Mirror Universe itself is an entire universe playing out this theme. Yet, okay, while that's not exactly the most original idea, the concept of nature versus nurture could have been fertile ground to explore. And to be fair, the film does have some really great moments that touch upon it in intriguing ways, but it never really delves too deeply beyond those few moments. The scene where Data downloads his memories into Before begins to raise some interesting ethical questions. He should have all my abilities. 
Yeah, but he would also have all of your memories as well. You feel comfortable with that? I feel nothing, Jordy. It is my belief that with my memory engrams, he will be able to function as a more complete individual. An individual more like you, you mean? Yes. This is actually a really great philosophical idea. Are all that we are just memories? And by downloading himself into B4, is Data really just removing B4's ability to be his own person? Is this really an ethical choice? That's actually a super intriguing concept and could have been an entire movie, but it gets really muddled here and ultimately goes nowhere after the scene as B4 never really develops Data's memories anyways. And it's only used to give us some hope that Data still might be alive somewhere in B4 at the end of the film. Maybe Star Trek Picard will delve into the interesting ethics here, but the film never really does. Moving on, this scene between Shinzan and Picard is actually one of my favorites in the entire movie. I want to know what it means to be human. I think of myself as an explorer. Well, well we always explore us. I was the first Picard to leave our solar system. It caused quite a stir in the family. But I spent my youth looking up at the stars, dreaming about what was up there. About new worlds. I actually really love that the film argues that the desire to explore, to be inspired by looking out into the stars, is actually innate in all humans. It's a spark that can be grown, nurtured, and inspired, as it was with Picard. Or it can be stamped out, mutilated, and perversed, as it was in Shinzon. But it's inside all of us, no matter what. That's a truly unique Star Trek idea, and one that does get brought up briefly later. Buried deep within you, beneath all the years of pain and anger, there is something that has never been nurtured. The potential to make yourself a better man. And that is what it is, to be human. To make yourself more than you are. But again, this scene just repeats the same beats as the first one. Really just making it more explicit rather than implicit. But never develops it. And then at the end of the film, Shinzon is just killed by Picard in a big fisty fight. And it never really completes the theme that the movie wanted to explore. What are we supposed to think about nature versus nurture by the end of the film? Are we supposed to think that we can't overcome our nature? That we are doomed to be whoever we were raised to be? That kind of seems to be what the movie ends on, what with Shinzon never being redeemed at any point, which is depressing. Wouldn't it have been better if Shinzon had at least tried to do something good at the end, or at least gave up the fight, to show that maybe we can be better than who we think we are? That would have felt truly Star Trek, but sadly the film never gets there. The film does have moments of inspiration, but it never truly capitalizes on them in any meaningful way. And ultimately, this and all the other issues surrounding this movie makes it feel really hollow. And with all of that, I've got to talk about one final thing. The death of Data. Do I have some friends? This death does not work. It's such an anticlimactic way for that character to go out. A character who has been the breakout star of this entire iteration of the franchise. He just shoots a thing and an explosion happens. I'm not saying that you need a big, long, drawn out scene, but for perhaps the biggest and most developed character of this entire cast to go out with a quick few seconds feels like a really missed opportunity. It's made even worse by the fact that his death really isn't a culmination of Data's arc at all. For seven seasons and three movies, we followed Data on his path to become more and more human. I could not allow that to happen, sir. Of course you couldn't. It was the most human decision you've ever made. Yet his death here really doesn't give us a final touchstone for that. Compare that to Spock's death in Star Trek The Wrath of Khan, which this movie Nemesis was really trying to uh, copy and ape off of, but never really got there. Spock's death is really structurally similar to Data's. We have a big fight between the captain and a rival who has a big doomsday weapon and who also has a personal relationship with our leader hero. And Spock, like Data, chooses to sacrifice himself in order to save the captain and crew that he loves. But in Spock's death, Spock, who has struggled with his emotions and logical side for his entire on-screen character development, finally is able to reach a catharsis in his final moments with Kirk. I have been, and always shall be, your friend. He calls Kirk his friend. In his last few moments, at least as far as we knew at the time, 
the character who fought so hard to keep his emotions down, decides to finally give in and reveal his true feelings for the man that he cares about. It feels like a completion of his character. We see his death as the culmination of the internal struggles that he's had his entire life on screen. Explain. You explain. That means that somebody is dead and you just sit there. It could be Captain Kirk. He's the closest thing you have to a friend. Lieutenant, my demonstration of concern will not change what has happened. Even if the actual overall battle was not his, but between Kirk and Khan, his death serves his character. Data's death, in contrast, doesn't serve his character at all. All we get is a quick nod with Geordi, his best friend throughout the entire series, a really quick goodbye to Picard, goodbye. and a quick callback to his first moments in the series. First time I saw Data, he was leaning against a tree in the holodeck, trying to whistle. <laughs> Funniest thing I ever saw. No matter what he did, he couldn't get the tune right. What was that song? A nice touchstone of continuity, to be sure, but it doesn't really serve to make us really feel a narrative resolution to his character. A major character's death, especially a character that has been so defined by a clear thematic thread, should resolve that thread. This isn't Game of Thrones, but Star Trek, where a movie should try and at least expound upon the themes of what makes humanity greater. But like the rest of the film, Data's death ends up just feeling meaningless. Ultimately, Star Trek Nemesis is a film that has a truly intriguing core. It's not the most original of Trek ideas, but it's one that could have worked and does in small bits and pieces throughout the film. Yet the film never really tries to say anything meaningful, either with its story, its characters, or action, or anything else. It's just a movie that kind of happens, because Paramount needed to make a Star Trek movie. It's sad, because it really has some neat threads that could have been pulled out further in more drafts. But here, there's just nothing to it. You watch it, and if it had been any other franchise in any other film, you'd have forgotten it almost instantly. In fact, the only thing emotionally memorable about the entire thing are just negatives. The disgusting treatment of Troy, the casual disposal of Data, and the emptiness that you feel knowing that this was this crew's last on-screen journey. It's honestly why I'm really happy that Star Trek Picard specifically is coming. Certainly, I'm excited to see the Trek universe finally move beyond this movie, but any Trek show could have done that. Heck, Star Trek Discovery will be doing that. No, I'm just glad that Nemesis wasn't really this generation's final journey that Star Trek Picard, hopefully, has the chance to be able to give us one last exciting, meaningful journey with this captain and crew, even if we only see them in bits and pieces throughout the entire series. While I do hold a soft spot for Nemesis in certain respects because of my personal history with it, in the end, Star Trek Nemesis's lasting legacy is really how much we as a fandom wish we could finally move beyond it, to once again boldly go where no one has gone before. We must strive to be more than we are, Law. It does not matter that we will never reach our ultimate goal. The effort yields its own rewards. Goodbye. To the future. To the future. To have some friends. Thank you so much for watching this really long dissection of Star Trek Nemesis. I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below. Did you like Nemesis? Did you hate Nemesis? Did I get things right? Did I get things wrong? Just let me know in the comments. I'd love to read them. And if you want to see more videos like this one, give my channel a subscribe. And if you want to help make these videos even better, like help improve me getting more equipment or uh, being able to do more videos on a more regular basis, please go check out my Patreon page and consider giving there. It honestly means the world to me. I hope that all of you, as always, live long and prosper. And special thanks to my commander level and above Patreons, Stefan Schuhart, Michael McGee, Boyd Earl, Law Lindley, Wellington Marcus, Munir Amlani, BBD, and Mari Neckar.